Okay, thank you, Jacob, for inviting me uh, for the opportunity to talk. Um, I will be covering most of the material that I'll be covering is uh, in the paper that we did with uh, Andrea Oldofredi and uh, that we did with Christina Ayala, and uh, uh, that sort of compares the logical structure of classical and quantum mechanics. Uh, a lot of the idea in the paper are part of a larger project and uh, called the Assumptions of Physics, and I will be also talking a little bit more about this later. The idea of the, the bigger project is really to identify a handful of physical principles from which the basic laws can be rigorously derived. So it's, it's a little bit like going back to, uh, uh, to how physics was done, say, even just in relativity, where you set your, uh, your principle and you derive the mathematical structure. Most modern theory instead just set the mathematical structure sort of out of nowhere. And we want to go back to sort of do, uh, do that. If you're interested in the project, here is the project website. I also have a YouTube channel where we take some of the interesting results, and some of them are even accessible to undergraduate level physics. A sub goal of this that we need is, of course, to create a study of mathematical formation for physical theory, and the idea that all mathematical definition must be justified from physical requirements so that we know what those mathematical uh, uh, definitions represent and we have no unphysical objects. So a lot of the things that we're going to be talking, it basically fits in spirit with that. We want to understand exactly what is uh, uh, the mathematical uh, structure inside this theory as related to, to logic, and so we see how that works. The, the two main things uh, that we want to discuss here is that the, the two main uh, theses that we're going to present is that when the proper comparison is set up between classical and quantum mechanics, you see that they follow the same logical structure, that they, so there is no need for, uh, for a different type of logic in quantum mechanics. In fact, it's so similar that both theory has, uh, have a, a non-distributive lattice that is embedded in a distributive one. The non-distributive lattice would be the the, the statements and the relationship between statements that is the one that, uh, that we associate typically with quantum logic and the distributive one is the one that is associated instead with uh, classical logic because it follows the rules of classical logic. But more in general, the, the, the point is that uh, it's not an accident or a coincidence that these uh, two theories share the same logical structure. In fact, uh, there is a, we want to put forward the claim that all physical theory must follow the same logical structure. This is because all physical theory must uh, deal with uh, experimental verification and experimental verifiable statements. That is, statements that have a test that in a finite time can verify the, the veracity of that statement. And what we see is that uh, these statements uh, mathematically characterize the open sets uh, of, uh, of a topology. Uh, more in general, you have statements uh, that are associated with a test, uh, regardless of whether they terminate or not. And these uh, give us a, a classical logic structure, a Boolean algebra, that is captured mathematically by the sigma algebra of these spaces. And then the other uh, point is that whenever you define a statistical mixing, you essentially define a linear operation. And this linear operation uh, defines subspaces, and therefore you always have a non distributive lattice of closed subspaces, which just comes from, from the existence of, of a linear space structure. So these are basically the two main points that we are, we are going to talk about. The talk is divided into three parts. So the first part, we're going to look at the supposed failure of, class, uh, of classical logic in quantum mechanics. The, the claim usually is that distributive law and the conjunction, the or in quantum mechanics, uh, have to work differently. And we will see how the temporary evaluation and statistical consideration uh, make it that quantum mechanics actually obeys classical logic. And uh, after having seen this, we go more uh, in the nuts and bolts uh, and see, we see really the mathematical structure, how it works. And we see that the lattice uh, of uh, quantum logic uh, does not contain uh, all physical relevant statements. So you, we can't express all the things that we'd like to express experimentally with just a proposition that comes from quantum logic. Instead, uh, uh, quantum mechanics already has a classical uh, lattice of statements, uh, which it does, uh, and, uh, and we'll see how that works. And then the idea is that if we compare classical statistical theory, you basically can find a parallel that mathematically works the same. And then in the third part, we will uh, we'll, we'll make this further claim. We look at the requirements for from experimental verification, and we'll see what we what I said before that there are these characteristics that sort of emerge as a necessity to all uh, to all theories. 
So before starting, a little bit of disclaimer, Andrea Aldofredi is the one fluent in all the philosophical and quantum logic literature, so I am less uh, uh, fluent in that. My interest and expertise really is, is, uh, lies in understanding how the details of the mathematical structure maps to physical concept and how you can go back and forth between the two spaces and what, what happens in the boundary. That's, that's what I'm interested in. Okay, so let's start with the supposed failure of classical logic. So in a classical uh, uh, logic, we have a distributive law that claims that uh, if we have three statements, P, Q, and R, P and Q or R is equivalent to P and Q or P and R. So you can write it one way, you can write it the other. This leads to the same way. Uh, the claim here is that in classical, in quantum mechanics, this uh, logic fails. And one of the examples that uh, is usually uh, put forward is this. We consider that we have an electron uh, that uh, with its spin that can be oriented along the x-axis and y-axis. So we have three statements. P is that the electron has x spin up. Q is that the electron has y spin up. And uh, R is that the electron has y spin down. And so the first claim says that spin in the y direction is either up or down. So whenever I measure things, it's going to be either up or down. So Q or R is equal to true. And the second claim is that the x and y direction are incompatible. So if I, uh, if I try to make the statement P and Q, this is going to be false. And P and R is also going to be false. So the idea is that if we suppose now P uh, to be true, this would be true and this would be true. So this side would be true, but this would be false. This would be false. This junction would be false. And so it would not be true that these two statements are the same. And therefore we say, ah, distributivity is violated. Another thing that is claimed to, to, to fail in quantum mechanics is uh, the, how the disjunction work. In classical logic, you would have uh, that the Q or R is true if and only if at least one of the two uh, uh, are true. So either is Q is true or at least R is true. And again, here the claim is that in quantum mechanics, this does not work. As we've said before, the spin in the y direction is either up or down. So Q or R is equal to true. And then uh, the idea is that this is true. This is always true, even if we prepared X spin up. But if we prepare X spin up, then Q and R individually are false, even though, as we said before, Q or R have to be true. And so the idea is that quantum disjunction works quickly. Okay, so the, uh, our, our position is that uh, you can, as we said before, the logical structure we're gonna see are actually the same in classical mechanics and quantum mechanics. So we can uh, sort of create thought experiments uh, in classical mechanics that seem to violate classical logic in the same way. So we imagine here that we have a ball, a place P above a hatch, and then we can open the hatch. And here there are two places where the ball can go rest, Q and R. And because of the symmetry of the problem, the, the ball will end in Q or R with 50% uh, with, uh, probability. So again, we can claim in, in a similar way that Q or R is equal to true because at the end, uh, we, we need to be in one of the two places. And the ball cannot be at two places as one. We can have if the P and Q has to be false and P and R has to be false. And these formally are exactly the same relationship on the other side. So we can claim ah, classical mechanics does not follow classical. And of course, uh, that, that you wouldn't say that. What you would say is that uh, there is temporal ordering, that uh, P is uh, uh, at a certain time and Q and R at a certain time are after we, uh, we open the hatch. So what we should do then, we should take into account the, uh, the temporal ordering in the quantum mechanics as well. So we put a qualifier I for input for the preparation and O for output. And what we find is that, uh, uh, yes, the, the Y direction is either up or down after the measuring. So Q O or R O is equal to true because here you must be either up or down. But there is no incompatibility between the X direction before the measurement and uh, the y direction after the measurement. So pi or qo is equal to true if we prepared x up and we can measure y up. And so if you then qualify all these statements with the appropriate i's and or's, uh, whatever you want it, you will find that distributivity is not valid. Analogously, we can look at the just junction. Yes, if we measure y spin up or y spin down, uh, we, if we measure uh, uh, spin in the y direction, you either have y or up. But then we can concoct another scenario where uh, 
and we need to have two different directions uh, that, that has, has to be taken into account. So for example, let's say that after we measure uh, uh, the spin in the y direction, if it's up, we remain the same. If it's down, we rotate it 90 degree in the x direction. Then of course, uh, now we have that QF or PF must be true because we must be in one of the two cases. But the fact that this is true at this time, it doesn't mean that it's true in this time and it's true in this time. So the claim that because QO and RO are true uh, uh, or QO is true at this time, it doesn't follow that, that it has to be true at all times. So how can we evaluate this? So now that we are so confused that we don't even know how to evaluate this junction in this context, how do we do it? So the idea is that since we are so confused, it's better to get equivalent statement for which we know how the disjunction work, evaluate there and see what happens. So we consider the, the, the two statements Q prime and R prime. The first one will say that the expectation of Y spin is H bar over two, and the other one that the expectation of Y spin is minus H bar over two. And now because the Y spin is extremal in, this, uh, in these values, the statements are equivalent. That this is true if and only if this one is true. And, and the same for, for both of them. So now we can compute the disjunction between these other two statements, and we know how to compute the disjunction there. It's just a, a disjunction on a normal expectation value, which is just statistics. And so we say that the expectation of Y spin is uh, plus or minus H bar over two. So the, the, the absolute value has to be H bar over two. And now this is not always true. But if we prepare, for example, the spin in X direction, the expectation would be zero. So it's not true that this is always be true. In fact, it's going to be true and only true if one of these two is true and therefore one of these two is true. So the quantum disjunction works exactly the same way, even in this case. There's nothing weird going on. Another way that people argue that the quantum disjunction does not work is using the uncertainty principle. And so we can we have here the plane of position and momentum, and we divide two cells here that are each of the sides h bar over four, such that they together, they form the bound of the uncertainty principle. So here you can say that Q or R could be true, but because of the uncertainty principle, Q, the fact that the state of the particle is in A, or R, the fact that the state of the particle is B, must be false because it does not satisfy the uncertainty principle. And again, you have in the, in the uh, you are in the position where you can claim, oh, this is uh, this can be true. The disjunction could be true even if the single statements are, are for false. And again, quantum disjunction works. And here, this I, I find very interesting how it gets resolved because again, it uh, we, we need to understand how the statistics work here more precisely. So instead of doing in quantum mechanics because it's easy to get confused, let's just consider a classical distribution. So we have rho of x and p which you can really think that you know, your mass distribution is actually spread out or that you have a probability of being in different places. It doesn't really matter. Now, if we take this and we get the statement, the state of the particle is in A, the, point, the problem is that this is a very ambiguous statement. We have to specify what they actually mean. So you could mean that the center of mass is in A, which means that you calculate the, the average X and the average P that gives you a point, and that point is within A. Or you could say one standard deviation of the distribution is in A. That is, you take one standard deviation on X, one standard deviation on Y, you make this box, and you say that this box is within A. And this is the thing that you are really describing when you're doing the uncertainty principle. You're looking at that box. And now what happens is that when we make the, the or and we uh, between the statement in A and a statement in B, things work differently. If you're looking at the center of mass, then it is true that this junction of, uh, of the two region is actually the statement the center of mass in, uh, is uh, in the union of the two regions. But in this case, it's not true that, 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 that this disjunction correspond on, on saying that the one standard deviation of the distribution is in, uh, a, in, in the region. Because you could have the box that it's halfway, and so half is in A and half is in B. So the statement is A is false because the box is not fully in A. The statement in B is false because the box is not fully in A, but uh, the statement on the union is true, right? And, uh, and so this is why this becomes differently, but, but this has nothing to do with, uh, with 
quantum mechanics. This is just properties of uh, statistical distribution. I mean, it, 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 quantum mechanics plays no role. It's it's the statistics. And again, it's the the, uh, the, the, the problem that we have to be clear what this statement actually means. So if we, if we transport this to quantum mechanics, is exactly the same. You just uh, change what we said. Instead of uh, starting from a classical state, you, you start with a quantum state. These uh, uh, symbols will correspond with the expectation value in quantum mechanics, and everything exactly works the same, both uh, like at a logical level and at the level. So again, the, the problem here is that we have to be precise in order to not be confused. So we have to be explicit in the process of the temporal ordering. So we have to ask ourselves what process, both in terms of preparation and measurement, is the subject, uh, is the system subjected to? Because the, the, the process, uh, the external process essentially puts conditions, boundary conditions uh, that will affect uh, the, the physics and the evaluation of the statements and so on. And again, this is nothing weird. Like all of physics is like that. And again, we have to, understand when the statements are evaluated, because again, that, that's also important too. We have to be more explicit and precise about which particular statistical and, and probabilistic attribute that we're talking about. We're discussing the center of mass, which is always the, the defined as a point, both in classical mechanics or not. Are we talking about the support, which is very ill-defined in quantum mechanics and very well-defined in, in classical mechanics? Are we talking about the standard deviation? And the point is that when we're making classical and quantum mechanics, we should compare similar things to similar things, expectation values to expectation values, standard deviation to standard deviation. If we do that, uh, actually a, a lot of problems sort of disappear because, because the two theories are not that different. Okay, so if uh, once we, we, we saw this, uh, this more general argument, then now it's time to go and look at more mathematically how, how these uh, things work in terms of uh, uh, lattice of statements and so on. The first point that I think it's important that if it's a, it's a guiding uh, uh, idea that uh, that works uh, in, in a lot of different places uh, is that there is a link between logic and set theory. So if we if we consider a, a lot of uh, uh, scientific statements such as the mass of the electron is within 500 plus or minus kilo electrovolt or you know this one that we have here, what you notice is that all of them form a pattern. Right, so they follow the same pattern. The pattern is X is in U and U is a subset of X. So X is the object that we are describing, which in this case would be the mass of the electron, the earthmost distance, the number of flavors of quarks. X is the set of all possible ways that the object can be. So for the mass of the electron would be all positive values uh, uh, of real values expressed in kilo electron volt for the number of uh, the flavors of quarks would be all the natural numbers. And then U is a possible, uh, uh, a subset of possible way that the object can be. So in this case would be this uh, uh, interval of coincidence. In this case would be the, the single number six, uh, you know, taken as a single one. So a set of just a single number. So the point is then that whenever you have a statement, you can sort of get a subset out of it. And whenever you have a subset, we can form a statement out of it. So in, in, uh, in, in mathematics, it's often that you see a, a, structures that uh, talk about the uh, subsets uh, of a particular set. And so what I'm telling you is that whenever you see something like that, you should think in the in back of your mind, oh, that's a set of statements with a particular structure imposed on it. And one way to, to look at that is uh, analyzing better uh, the probability theory. And then we are going to find that there is an, a, a tight link between logic and probability theory. So again, mathematical probability space is uh, three objects. One is a sample space, which is a space of points that are the set of all possible outcomes. So for a uh, six space dice would be one, two, three, four, five, six. So there are six possible outcomes. Then there is a sigma algebra that represents a, a collection of all the events we consider. So um, the result is even, is odd, is less than three, more than five. All of these are considered events in this sigma algebra. And then we have a probability measure that assign a probability, not to the sample space, but to each event in the sigma algebra. And now the sigma algebra mathematically is one of these things that it's a collection of subset where you can take the complement the countable union and the countable intersection and remain within that set of the sets. And again, as we said before, there is relationship between statements and subset. So instead of thinking it as a set of sets, we should think it as a collection of statements with a particular algebraic structure. 
And so the uh, complement will become the negation, the countable union will become the disjunction, the countable intersection will become the logical end, the uh, conjunction. And so what happens is that the sigma algebra is really a countably complete the Boolean algebra. It's a Boolean algebra because you can do the net, the or, and the end, and it's countably complete because you can do the end and the or over countably many end. And so what this tells us already here is that probability theory requires classical logic, right? The, 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 the definition of a probability space has here a Boolean algebra. So uh, it's kind of a, we can't just say that a, a statement, a, a theory like uh, quantum mechanics that is uh, in, like in practice a probabilistic theory somehow does not require a, a, a classical logic and needs something else because the definition of a probability space actually requires classical logic. Okay, so this is uh, somewhat interesting. There are these object of sigma algebra that uh, are needed to create a probability space. Well, the first question should be, do the Hilbert space, the thing that we use in quantum mechanics, have a sigma algebra? And mathematically, you can say that a Hilbert space is a normal vector space, and a normal vector space is a metric space, and a metric space is a topological space, and a topological space is a Borel sigma algebra. So yes. But of course, this does tell, tells us nothing, because this is just mathematical gibberish if somebody doesn't know what these things are. And it doesn't tell us whether this thing is uh, physically significant, right? It could be just some mathematical thing that, that helps for calculation but has no physical bearing. So the question now is, uh, is the Borel sigma algebra something intangible, something we can actually understand and relate to the physics? And this is how we should look about it. That the metric space defines the distance. In, uh, in our specific case, so the distance in our Hilbert space of quantum mechanics is in terms of probability. I give you, uh, you know, I prepare one state, I measure another state, uh, and the probability is a measure of the distance between the two states. If the states are far apart, uh, then the probability of transition is zero. If the, the, states are, the, the, uh, the states are similar, they're close to each other, and therefore the probability is gonna be close to one. So a, a distance, just the distance itself, allows us to write statements of the type that the object X is within epsilon of a reference Y, right? So we take Y as a point, we create a, a sort of a bubble around it with length uh, uh, epsilon, and we ask whether the, uh, the object X is within that. So it's, it's the same thing, that we have an object X and we have a set U, and the set U is created by X and the distance. And therefore we can just write statements that are parameterized by our center point Y and our distance uh, epsilon. And this would be you know, mathematically the distance between X and Y uh, square is uh, less than our epsilon square. So the, 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 the point is that any element in the sigma algebra is constructed from statements of this type using countable disjunction, countable conjunction and negation. So once you understand these statements uh, and they're not that difficult to understand, uh, you can say everything else is just uh, construction with classical logic on top of that. So the idea is that, yes, this, these things are actually intelligible. We, we have a clear, crisp meaning of, of what these things uh, mean physically. Uh, and so they're good, but we can use this to, to, to understand what's going on. And now, of course, it's going to be the further question. Well, what is the relationship between these sets of sigma algebra that maybe you never heard about and the statements of quantum logic? Gabrielle, um, yes. could you go back to the previous slide? There was a question. Yes. Uh, Rob, do you feel okay asking the question? Yes. Um, the question is, you have the object X is within epsilon of reference Y, mm -hmm. and then you give it an equation in which X appears on the right-hand side, but not the left-hand side. And if the left-hand side is supposed to be the formalization of uh, what's in English, X should occur, I don't know where X is an element of S epsilon Y or something like that. So the equation on the right gives us a set. And so the statement is X is in with that, within that set. So X there in that statement is just the dumb variable to get, uh, to get the set. And so, so then you want X as an element of so S of epsilon Y is a set? So or... it's, it's again, I was saying before that uh, you, you have relationship between a statement and a set. So on this side, I have a statement, right? And on, on this other side, I have the, the, the set that corresponds to, to that statement. 
So on, on the right side, X is a dummy variable so that you can get the set. Uh, and on, on, on this side, the statement is really parameterized by only E and Y because the X is going to be the, the variable that you're looking for. And the, what are the elements of the set? The elements of the set are the, uh, uh, the points in the space that satisfy this condition. So there are all the axes for which uh, the distance between x and y square is less than epsilon square. Thank you. OK, so let's continue. So the, the question now is understanding how those uh, those statements and those sets relate to the uh, to the statements and stats that we get in the lattice of quantum logic, and so the idea is that the statements of quantum logic corresponds to the closed subspaces of the Hilbert spaces, right? Again, statement in quantum logic corresponds to set, and those set has to, happens to be the closed subspaces in, of the Hilbert space, and the sigma algebra by construction contain, contains all the closed subsets. Therefore, we have that quantum logic is a proper subset of the sigma algebra, right? So every statement that is in quantum logic is also in the sigma algebra. So everything that we can describe here, we can also describe here. And now the further question is, are these extra statements physically useful? It could be that only the really only the physically interesting one are here and that there is nothing interesting here. And so the idea is to look at statements of the type the expectation of the observable A is within U, where U again is, is a set that, that, that is a bound on, on the observable. And the idea that these types of statements are part of the, uh, in general, of the, the sigma algebra, but they are not in general part of quantum logic. So as an example, we can consider the statement, the average X spin is zero, right? So if we imagine this is the block sphere, this would be the Z direction, these, uh, this is Z up and this is Z down, this statement corresponds to all the points in the equator, right? If we prepare X or Y or anything in the X y or Y plane, the, uh, the expectation of the X spin would be zero. But the, the issue is that this, uh, uh, this subset is not a closed subspace because you could take uh, x, uh, x up and x y and x down, x up and x down form a basis. And therefore you can, by linear combination, get any point that you have uh, on the sphere. In fact, if you take any two distinct point, you can get all the points on the sphere. The only closed subspaces here would be the single points or the full sphere. Those are the only closed subspaces that there are. And so this is not uh, a statement that would be inside the, the, the statements of quantum logic. And one can show that these type of statements are within the sigma uh, algebra because uh, the expectation of A is given by the inner product of psi with respect to A psi. And you can see that this function uh, is continuous and the fact that it's continuous is going to map Borel sets to Borel sets. And this is the mathematical proof that tells you that. But the point here is that there are plenty of physically meaningful statements here. In fact, most of the things that we actually measure in physics are statements of this kind, are statements about the probability, about uh, the expectation of an observable, about uh, the scattering processes, uh, 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 decay processes, and so on. So there are all statements of this kind. The only things that there are in this kind are uh, single shot measurements. I, I measure one thing once of, a, of, about the, uh, of a particular system, and I, I learn something about the system, but it's typically something that, uh, that the system has after I perform the, the projection, after I perform the measurement. A single shot measure never really tells you much of what was actually the incoming state that typically is the thing that you want to measure. So these, uh, these statements are actually, oops, a lot more important than the one that are here. So it's important actually that we go and look at the whole sigma algebra and, 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 and the statement that are in quantum logic would not be enough. Again, once we have this and we realize this structure, we can make a parallel with, uh, with classical mechanics. In the same way that in quantum mechanics, we have a Hilbert space of a wave function. In classical mechanics, you can have a Hilbert space of the, the distribution. It's just that you have to put a square root in front of that. With these two structures, you're always going to get a metric induced topology. You're going to have a notion of distance. You, you, you create your distance ball around each point in the same way. 
And you then create your Cantoni complete Boolean algebra statement, your sigma algebra, which again is structured in the same way. And because both of these have bilinear spaces, they both have elastics of closed subspaces, which again will follow the same rules on one side or the other, or the other side, will not be distributive, and so on, will have the same property. So it's really formally the same thing. So to summarize, probability theory requires accountably complete the Boolean classical algebra of statements. You, you can't really get out of that. Quantum mechanics comes already equipped with such a lot of those statements, so the Borel algebra. Again, this is not something that, uh, even if you don't uh, never heard of it, this is something that you typically, mathematicians typically use to prove uh, a, a lot of theorems, uh, even uh, the spectral theorems, a lot of version of the proof will, will work on, on, uh, on the Borel sigma algebra to prove convergence. So it's, it's, it's not a weird mathematical uh, structure that, that I made up here. Uh, the Borel algebra includes all quantum logic statements, so everything that uh, quantum logic can describe can also be described within the Borel algebra. We're not losing anything. And the Borel algebra includes statistical statements, which are of physical interest, the one about expectation values, that are not part of the quantum logic statements, right? Quantum logic then does not allow us to capture all physical statements, only the ones uh, that uh, happen after a projection, after a single shot measure. And again, if you want, it was wants to concentrate only on those, then it makes sense that they would lock at this slide of the statement. But as a general physics theory, that, that those are not enough. And then the, the, the further point is that that structure exists in the same way, formally in the same way for classical distribution. Of course, the relationship between individual statements might be different because they're two different theories, but the formal structure is the same. So the point here is that quantum mechanics and classical mechanics, when properly compared, share a common logical structure. Now, this doesn't mean that the two theories are mathematically the same. The measure theoretic structure will be different. But the point is that the difference starts after the logic. Like the, the logical structure is the same. And now this leads to the question, are these structures the same by coincidence, or there is a deeper, region, a deeper reason why uh, these two theories would have this, uh, this similar structure? And so let's look at uh, the, the sort of the common structure that what we claim that there is a common a logical structure for scientific theories. So the idea is that we want to capture the scientific remind of experimental verification. The fact that we're gonna have to describe things that in the end are we're gonna be able to test in practice. So the basic notion here is the will be the very viable statement, an assertion that can be experimentally verified in a finite time. So we have a test. The test finishes in a, in a uh, uh, if the, the statement is true, the test will finish in a finite time successfully. And every time that the uh, uh, statement, the, the test uh, finishes successfully in a finite time, then the statement is going to be true. The type of statement that we're thinking about are things like the mass of the photon is less than 10 to the minus 13 EV. That's something that we can, in principle, in a finite time, maybe very long if you have to learn a lot of things of how to test that stuff, but in principle, that, that can be done in, in a finite time. Now, so I think instead, like the mass of the photon is exactly zero, that is not going to be verifiable in a finite time due to infinite precision. In fact, we're never going to be able to, to, to verify that uh, precisely. And something else that can work as a counterexample is the idea is a statement there is no extraterrestrial life. In a finite time, all that we can do is look at, at different places and see that we don't find the life, but then absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So when we don't find anything, we, we just can continue indefinitely to keep not finding anything. Of course, if we do find something, then we can always tell somebody else, oh, yes, just point your telescope in that direction and you'll see the, the, the extraterrestrial life. And so then people could verify things in a finite time. So there is sort of this asymmetry between verification. The other thing that we have to keep in mind is that the meaning of the statements, their relationship, and what the truth values are right depends on the context. It depends on the premise, on the theory, on uh, uh, or, or what we want to do, on boundary conditions. Uh, just to give you an example, even the statement, the mass of the electron is 511 plus or minus 0 0.5 kiloelectron volt. If we're measuring the mass, uh, this is a verifiable hypothesis because we're measuring the mass. In principle, we don't know what the math is, so it could be true or false. 
But when we perform particle identification in a detector that we see our uh, tracks in a bubble chamber, we assume that to be true so that when we see a, a, a trajectory for which the mass is within the range, we can say, oh, yes, that must be an electron or a positron and, and so on. So the, the role of that statement changes uh, depending on the context, depending on what we're trying to do. So what, once we accept that, uh, the, we can basically say that we're going to have a context of uh, a set, which is going to be a set of statements. We well define logical relationship between them. And if we, it's a physical theory that we want to describe within this context S, so there's going to be a, a subset of statements SV that are going to be the one that are verifiable. That is the one that have an experimental test that has uh, uh, this particular relationship with the, the truth of the statement. The, the, if the statement is true, then we have success, and we have success in finite time only if the statement is true. The test could also fail, but the test could also be undefined, could not terminate, or could give no valid value for a particular thing. And this is the type of reasoning that you know, we, we borrow, in a sense, from computer science, this idea that we have a finite time to be able to do this. And this actually gives us a different structure. And we can already see, for example, that the negation of the logical knot of a verifiable statement is not necessarily a verifiable statement because of this non-termination issue. If we switch a T with F and success with failure, we would have an undefined of the truth. And so there would be cases in which the statement is true, but the test don't, doesn't terminate. And therefore the statement is not verified. So we need to take to get rid of the knot. We can, for, uh, we can test the uh, conjunction and the test of the conjunction, we just test all the, all the uh, we run the test for all the statements. And if they all terminate successfully in finite time, then the whole thing terminates in finite time. And so the, 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 the conjunction of a finitely many statements uh, is also verifiable statements. We can recycle the test. But it can't, we can't have a conjunction of infinitely many because if we run infinitely many tests, then it would require infinite time and then we will not be able to do it. For the disjunction is a little bit easier because once one test is su uh, successful, we can just quit the procedure and be done. So even if we have another infinity to go through, well, that it doesn't matter. We, we don't need to, to, to verify all of those. We, so we can quit before. But this infinity has to be countable because we need to be able to find that test that terminates. So we have a, a countable disjunction is valid within and we remain in verifiable state. So what we basically get from the requirements of the experimental verifiability is these two things, is that verifiable statements are closed only under finite conjunction and countable disjunction, right? So it's not the standard classical logic here. It's really something different. It's called the heightened algebra for people that, 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 that know what that means. And then the other requirements is that we can at most uh, verify countably many statements, right? In the limit of arbitrary long time, right? We, we can keep uh, test one more, one more, one more. So we, we have a countable series that we can, in principle, go through. Well, not through the whole thing, but at our disposal to go through. So we take these two requirements, and then it makes sense that we define something called an experimental domain as a set of verifiable statements that is closed under finite conjunction and countable disjunction, because those are the operation that, that are good for verifiable statements. And uh, they are generated by countably many verifiable statements. The idea is that all the statements here are just uh, uh, conjunction or disjunctions of countably many, and the countably many basically cover the full suite. Another thing that makes sense to, uh, uh, to then define the from the experimental domain is what we call a, a theoretical domain, which uh, gives us all statements uh, that have a test, regardless whether it terminates or it doesn't terminate. So at least we have a test. So it kind of makes sense as an experimental procedure because uh, if there is an experimental procedure attached to it, uh, even though you know, it might not terminate, may terminate, we don't know. And the way that you construct this mathematically you just close, uh, do the closure of an experimental domain under negation, countable uh, conjunction, and countable disjunction, and you get the set of objects that represent these statements uh, uh, that have a test associated with it. Within the theoretical domain, you find uh, what we call the possibilities, and these are statements that give the complete picture. So if I suppose that that statement is true, then I know the truthful, the truthful or falsehood of all the other statements. Right? So if I know that the mass of the photon is exactly zero, then I know that it's not uh, within uh, uh, three and four kiloelectron volt uh, and that it's less than 10 to the minus 13 nanotron volt. Right? 
So once we, I know that, I, that that statement is true, I can tell all the coarser granularity statement uh, uh, whether they're true or not. And mathematically, if you know a little bit of order theory, this would be the atoms of the lattice, but it's important for us that we don't start from the atoms of the lattice because these are idealizations. We start from the verifiable statement, which are actually objects that are more close related to experimental verification. Okay, so we have this structure. We have these theoretical statements that are things to the test. We have the verifiable, uh, verifiable statement, the test that succeed in final time if the statement is true. And we have the possibility that basically represent the experimental distinguishable thing. And the magic is that this maps uh, this maps absolutely well to current mathematical structure. The possibility would be the points of our space. The, fair, the verifiable statement that corresponds to open sets in a topology and the theoretical statements correspond to the Borel set of the sigma algebra. Now, if you don't know what sigma algebras or topologies are, the topology is the structure upon which we construct the differential geometry uh, manifold and all of that. And sigma algebra are the, the, the structure on which we uh, define the measure theory, the four theories of integration, uh, probability theory, information theory, they're all based on, on sigma algebra and properties of these things. So these are two sort of fundamental uh, uh, structure that then we use in all of the mathematics and in, uh, that we use in physics. So it, it's kind of neat uh, and fitting that uh, it's uh, the, the requirement of experimental verification that tells us that we need to have those structures. So we really can count on these things. The, the neat thing is that this also gives us a very uh, precise connection between the physical concepts and the, the mathematical representation. And it's uh, it's so precise that you, you can literally go and read a lot of the proof and translate in physical and meaningful language uh, in terms of uh, experimental verification. The other thing that you can do is you can prove interesting general results. So you, can, you find that every set of physical distinguishable cases is a T0 second countable topological space. So if you don't know topology, maybe you don't know what that means, but these spaces are very nice to work with. Like they're, they're very regular. And again, it's, it's nice that the, that the requirement of experimental verification needs, uh, gives us nice uh, and regular spaces to work on. It tells us that every set of physical distinguishable cases can have up to the cardinality of continuum. So this tells us sort of mathematically that any issue of large cardinal of epsilon number in, in set theory are absolutely of no interest to us. We're never gonna be able to, to, to be interested in those things because experimentally we can't distinguish as many of those things. But something like the continuum of positive, whether there is an infinity set between the, the, the countable and the continuum, that may play a role. So look, maybe that's something that, 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 uh, that he yields something interesting. Another thing that, uh, that sort of answered, that the risk answers is the idea that in physics, we always look for well-behaved functions. And the idea that we now have a reason why we, we, we look for these, uh, we always have these well-behaved functions. The idea is that we have a relationship between the two sets of experimental distinguishable cases. If I say something on one, I can induce something on the other set. So an experimental verifiable statement here, an open set, has to be the reverse, uh, the reverse image must be another open set, must be another thing that we can verify because these two things are gonna be equivalent. And therefore the, all our functions that we're gonna be interested in physically, they're gonna be topologically continuous where the topology again captured the experimental verification. So in a sense, the, our functions are well behaved because they must preserve uh, experimental verifiability. And uh, the things can be a little bit different in terms of between topological continuity and, and analytically continu uh, con analytical continuity. And uh, the interesting fact is that if those things uh, are different so that we have a, a function that it's uh, discontinuous, like for example, when we have phase transition, some of the, of the property of the material jump. But the point is that during the phase transition at the triple point, there is something special that happens in terms of verification. We can verify that we are at that point, while we typically cannot verify that we are at a specific point anywhere on a continuum. So those things are topologically, in this, in, in, again, in the sense of, of experimental distinguishability are different. And so though it makes sense that they are analytically discontinuous because they're still topologically continuous because there is something that is happening at the topological level. So the point is that, what I'm trying to say is that these analogies really, really go deep. You can really go in the detail of things and everything makes sense in a way that we ourselves couldn't really imagine 
uh, at the beginning. And the cool thing is that these are general results. These are going to be valid on, on any theory that has to satisfy uh, experimental verification. So given this, I want to talk a little bit more about the, the structure of our overall projects of the assumption of physics. And so as, as you see, what we want to try to build is this idea of a general theory of a basic requirements then definition that are valid in all theories. And so we have this layer of experimental verification and we said this requirements is gonna give us topologies with sigma algebra, things that, 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 that are sort of a foundation of a lot of mathematical things. Another requirement that, that we are exploring, we still don't know exactly how to, uh, to, uh, to formulate is the idea of uh, informational granularity that each statement gives us some information and we need to be able to compare whether one statement gives us more information than the other. And the idea is that this should be at the, at the core of the measure theory of probability of geometry because you can express all those properties in terms of how much information do you get from that statement, which is interesting. Then and everything that we are going to shoot for, it's a common a definition for states and processes, like some kind of meta definition that has to be valid in all physical theory because all physical theory must have states and have processes. And so the idea is that what are the constraints on the objects and on the variable that we are uh, sort of trying to, to group together uh, such that we can actually define a, a system uh, as a thing and then assign states to. And so the idea is that if we had this general theory, then we would have the space of one post uh, scientific theory that then we can give to a mathematician that uh, he would go and, and categorize all these things that have mathematician done. And so we, we sort of can understand more than the scope and, and things and, and what type of theories that we can have. Then the, the, the thing that we, that we want to do, of course, our, our project is called the assumption of physics. We want to be able to take assumptions. And so we basically say, for example, that the system is infinitesimally reducible. Uh, there is a system, it has parts, the parts are parts, the parts are parts, and you can go there uh, uh, arbitrarily small, and then the state of the whole uh, is equivalent to the state of, uh, of the set of the parts. And then, of course, this would be a, a constraint on, uh, on, the on the type of statement that you can say about the system and their logical relationship. And so the idea is that once we have this assumption put in, we find the physical theory as a specialization of the general theory under this assumption. So the idea, our claim, is that that, that, uh, that uh, uh, assumption is responsible to then identify the, the, the classical phase space. Of course, you can make another assumption to say the system is irreducible as a whole, and I can't know what the parts are doing. I can't, I can't go at a lower granularity than that. And then the idea that what we think is going to happen is that then quantum space space is, is what you're going to get. Then you can have uh, those are where assumption of state of whole parts of relationship, you can have a, 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 uh, assumption on future and past relationship, like determinism and reversibility, you put that, you get another set of, uh, of, uh, of theories, and then you would find, for example, that the intersection uh, between uh, uh, the infinitism and reducibility and determinism and reversibility gives you exactly how many things. So this is sort of, uh, to give you a sense, that these are the type of things uh, that we would like to, to sort of proceed in, in this general project and, and how we want to. Uh, to, to sort of reorganize a, a, a lot of basic uh, science or basic physics. So let's go back now uh, uh, to our, uh, our logic. So as I said, we, we wanted to make the claim that uh, that logical structure that we, that we have in both in classical mechanics and in quantum mechanics uh, uh, follows and it, uh, from just the, the fact that we, are, we have a, a generic physical theory. And from what we have said all before, basically the, the, the um, uh, the, the reasoning goes like this. We want to describe the, sta the space of states of a system. Then uh, this, uh, the states themselves must be a set of physically distinguishable elements or a thing that we can tell apart experimentally. And then these must be a topological space and must have a topology that represents the verifiable statement and must have a sigma algebra, right? So we have our, our sort of classical logic and, and this other heightened intuitionist logic type of things. Then the other thing that we must allow is for ensembles because uh, uh, what we measure in practice are repeated measurements. So we need to have ensembles. But if we have ensembles, we have an idea of statistical mixture. We prepare 50% of this uh, 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 mix literature or 50% of the disaggregate mixture. So the statistical mixture itself imposes a linear operation. So this becomes a linear space. But if it says a linear space, then there's going to be a lattice of subspaces that, that, that this linear uh, operation important. And so these are necessary structures for what we've seen before that describe objects that can be experimental. 
So we, it's something that we have. So to wrap it up, once the full meaning of quantum proposition is properly taken into account, quantum mechanics follows classical logic. Quantum logic proposition only apply to single such management and therefore are very limited use. Hilbert spaces are very equipped with a classical logic structure. The sigma algebra that includes all quantum logic statements plus all statistical statements. And the space of classical statistical distribution is also a Hilbert space, which is equipped with a similar quantum logic values. The pattern stems from our requirements of experimental verification and so is common to all the theories, as we said before. The topology maps to verifiable statements, sigma algebra to statements associated with the test, and statistical mixing leads to uh, linear spaces, therefore the non-distributive lattice of those subspaces. So I'll end with a, a list of resources. If you are interested more in the project, we, we have a website there. There's just a list of open problems in case anybody has idea of how to solve some of them, uh, that would be helpful. Uh, we have a YouTube channel in which we popularize, we, we, uh, we popularize the results of research. We also have a recorded presentation for some of the paper. I'll leave here three uh, papers that might be uh, interesting. The first one is reverse physics, which is uh, very fun. It's a much more at the higher level on sort of physical concepts and how these uh, uh, can rederive the laws. Uh, there is uh, something that we just put in the preprint, which is uh, a geometric and physical interpretation of the actual principle that tell you exactly geometrically what it is and, and why it's there. There is another uh, paper that we did with Lorenzo Maccone uh, trying to uh, showing that uh, one of the uh, quantum postulates is actually redundant, the one about the composite system. And if you're interested in to have update, please subscribe to that page. So that's it. Thank you very much, Gabrielle. All right, so uh, we finished a minute early. Thank you so much. Um, we're gonna take a, a six minute break and we'll reconvene uh, at the beginning of the next hour for uh, uh, questions and discussions. So everybody take, take a brief break and we'll, we'll be right back. And when we come back, people can start raising their hands. All right, so we have a first question from Rob. Rob, go ahead. Uh, yes, your program um, rests on a distinction between physical laws and physical principles. Um, how do you draw the contrast? Um, so, At the end of the day, they are both like uh, statements about the system. So if I say something like uh, the evolution of the system is deterministic and reversible, that implies that I will have, for example, a law of evolution. And then if I also say, ah, the system is uh, reducible, infinitesimal and reducible, and uh, it's made of independent degree of freedom, for example, those uh, three, uh, uh, assumptions will lead to the uh, classical Hamiltonian, right? So you will have the definition of phase space and uh, uh, the law of evolution that is given by the Hamiltonian. And in our mind, uh, uh, since you can go back and forth, like if I give you a Hamiltonian system, then it must satisfy those three properties. And if I give you those three properties, then you have a Hamiltonian system with those laws. Conceptually, uh, I don't think that there is a, a distinction in the sense that there are just statements that you're saying about the system and uh, you can formulate in one way or formulate in the other. I don't know if that answers the question. Well, so the principle of relativity um, is just on the same footing as say uh, Newton's law of universal gravity. So th there is gonna be different uh, uh, so the, the, the level at which the, uh, the uh, let's say, of importance of the assumption is there. So for example, the idea that uh, I must have uh, experimental verification, right? That, that's a sort of a basic uh, uh, property principle, whatever you want to call it, that all physical laws will, uh, all physical theory will have, right? The fact that something is deterministic and reversible is just an assumption that I made on a particular system because in some condition that system satisfied those properties, but in other cases it may not, right? Something like the third laws of thermodynamic, for example, would be one of those things that it's more of a principle that it's always there that, uh, um, that, that you sort of can't violate because if you start violating, you, you have something that, that sort of doesn't work. So that there is sort of a degree. So this is something that we discuss in the reverse physics paper, that there is sort of a degree of, uh, 
of, of importance of relative strength of this assumption. And it's something they would like to have some sort of language to be able to analyze more, but uh, we don't, we haven't, we haven't done as much, uh, uh, let's say, meta thinking in that realm. We are more uh, concerned in getting the right assumption and see how they work and make sure that the mathematical uh, thing works than, uh, uh, than sort of uh, think it at, uh, at a meta level like that. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next hand I have is from Logan and then Joanna. I think Logan and I may have a similar question, but Logan, go ahead. Um, yeah, well, since I posted this in the chat, I think this will be my question, at least the first one. I have a bunch of questions. Um, uh, the the about, about the role of Hilbert space in classical mechanics. So I have two questions. One is you sort of shift from what I would imagine as phase space points representing the states of a classical system to distributions over phase space, sort of a, a, a move from to a statistical perspective, number one. To me, I, I've, I've read many of your, several of your papers on this, and that has always seemed to me a bit of a, a sleight of hand move that I'm not totally comfortable with, how you, how you get, how you make that shift to statistical distributions over classical phase space. And then part two is, if you want to use a Hilbert space representation in classical phase space, it looks like you're using something like Kupon von Neumann um, representation, Hilbert space representation in classical physics. Um, and I think part of what I have a challenge there is now um, the, you, you don't have a, you don't have a convex probability structure where the extreme points are the um, pure states. So in other words, in um, so in classical physics, if you have statistical distributions, the delta functions basically on phase space are the extreme points for your convex sets that are statistical mixtures of, of um, classical states. But those delta functions are not elements of the Hilbert space if you're looking at a Kuhlmann von Neumann type representation. So I think if you if you go to that Hilbert space representation, you lose a sense of pure states versus mixed states, and that's always been a concern of mine at that. Anyway, there are like three questions interlaced in there, but maybe you can try to address some of those. Okay, so uh, let's see how to skin this cat. Uh, so yes, we basically think uh, of the points in phase space, uh, not uh, really as points, but essentially as uh, limits uh, of uh, the distribution that is, uh, you know, that, that you keep preparing and preparing. Uh, what, uh, like the, the standard thing is that you, you think that, oh, I have a, a phase space structure that gives me Hamiltonian mechanics, and then on top of that, I build statistical mechanics. And we uh, think this view is not quite right because uh, this, the symplectic structure that allows you to measure uh, areas and volumes that give you the count of states, it's the same structure that you need to define both uh, to have uh, statistical mechanics to define the entropy and also to define the uh, Hamiltonian evolution. So saying that uh, uh, Hamiltonian mechanics is classical mechanics, just movement of points, uh, is missing the fact that uh, Hamiltonian mechanics is not really transporting points. They're transpor it's transporting infinitesimal volumes of phase space in a particular way. So it's much better to think as the, the classical uh, phase space point as this uh, unit uh, uh, volume and so on. Uh, regarding the technical question whether uh, this uh, square root of uh, is uh, the, uh, I don't remember the name, uh, the Koopman von, uh, von Neumann. I, I just went uh, uh, to Wikipedia. Those, they use uh, a, a, a complex vector space. There, I was just using a, 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 a real vector space. So I don't know whether that makes a difference or not. But the, the point would be that if you imagine uh, sort of on, on classical mechanics and quantum mechanics, you imagine the, uh, uh, the set of all the mixed states ordered by entropy, right? The idea is that uh, uh, the pure states, uh, in quote, both in classical mechanics uh, and in quantum mechanics are just the, 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 the bottom of, of, the, uh, of the scale. In quantum mechanics, they stop at zero, right? You have the zero for entropy, those are the pure states. 
And the one in, uh, in classical mechanics, they are at minus infinity, right? So they are at the limit. So you can think as Delta Dirac's, uh, which of course then, uh, you know, have problems, but that, that's, exactly, that's exactly what happens. And so this is something that we discuss in the reverse physics uh, uh, paper is that uh, uh, really the, the thing that is there quantum mechanics to fix uh, in, in classical mechanics is the notion that, well, you have a third law of thermodynamics. So you have to put a zero for the entropy. You can't go to minus infinity. And if you put a lower bound on entropy in uh, classical mechanics as well, for example, you get an uncertainty principle in the same way, right? So there, there are all these, uh, so I guess the point is this, that uh, we think that the foundation of uh, classical mechanics, quantum mechanics, uh, thermodynamics, and statistical mechanics uh, should be seen as a whole more than uh, you know in this distinct thing with their own rule. And if you start seeing them uh, as they are interconnected, uh, you basically start seeing okay, they are all idealization of something uh, like uh, more uh, general, and you're working essentially on, on, on different types of idealizations. Does that address any of the questions that you had? I think. I mean, I think that's helpful. I'm. I'm still. Um, I still struggle with the notion that you know, a, 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 what I would consider a, phys a statistical distribution over phase space is the state of a classical system. Like, in what sense is, in what sense is rho x of you know rho a function of x and p? In what sense is that the state? of the system and then of course this gets to is this the state of information you know is this your is this your subjective postulate of the state of this okay. like what is this what is this row right so the, the way that we typically think of uh, uh, a mixed state uh, we essentially uh, think of them as preparation procedure so i have a device and i push a button and prepares a system and, uh, and this idea is sort of a requirement for uh, science because we have the notion of uh, reproducibility. So really the, the, the thing that I have is uh, I have something that produces my states and then, then I go and, and do something with that. And then of course, this preparation procedure is never perfect, right? I can imagine that it's uh, made perfect or I can think of it uh, as uh, the statistical mixture of more perfect uh, processes, right? And then at that point, uh, I can uh, uh, I, I can sort of in classical mechanics, I have the notion that all oh, these uh, uh, these ensembles are uh, infinitely reducible. I can always think of an ensemble as made of two ensembles. There's the mixture of two ensembles and so on. So you you, you go this uh, infinite uh, you know, tower of infinity that you never end. Instead of classical mechanics, you reach a saturation point that says no, this is as good as I can prepare, and uh, you are never going to get anything better than this. So. This is how we think about those things. I mean, I realize that it's kind of a black boxy way of thinking, but at the end of the day, it's the black box uh, that I that we have as a modelization of what we are doing when we're doing physics. <laughs> um, so I just posted something in the chat. Uh, there's a <clears throat> paper from 1976 by George Sudershen um, uh, that that may be even a little bit closer. Uh, to, to the construction that uh, you're describing than the original Koopman von Neumann formulation. The Wikipedia entry uh, on the Koopman von Neumann formulation is a little bit confusing because it kind of blends together the original Koopman von Neumann formulation, which was not about classical probability distributions at all, and this work by Sudershen. And, and today they've kind of been fused together and they're thought of as the same thing. Um, but if you take a look at that, I think you, you, you might find it uh, helpful to look at. Um, so if I may just follow up on, on Logan's question, this question about states. Um, traditionally, when we think about classical theories, in a very sort of flat-footed sense, we often think of them as, as, um, as, as formulations of, of what you might call the ontology of the classical system. We represent ontic states, states of being of the classical system, with, let's say, a point in phase space or, or some appropriate notion of a state space. Uh, and then, of course, we have the nomology, the rules, the dynamics that describe how the system is supposed to behave. And then we imagine sort of layering on top epistemic uncertainty about what's going on. And then we have the right. probability distributions. And then we go over to quantum mechanics. And the natural move is to say, well, in quantum mechanics, instead of configuration spaces or phase spaces, we have Hilbert spaces. And instead of uh, points in configuration spaces or phase spaces, we have uh, you know, un you know, we have uh, rays or, or unit vectors in Hilbert space. And so those must be now the ontological things. 
Um, it seems to me that what, what you're saying here is that maybe we should rethink how we talk about classical theories and regard them in a more instrumentalist uh, sense. When we talk about a state of a classical theory, we shouldn't be talking about the ontic state. We should be talking about a preparation, an experimental sort of statement about you know, what you could measure about the system uh, and, and a reflection of our, of our you know, empirical knowledge about the system. And that's what you mean by state. And when you phrase things that way, then the natural states are you know, more akin to classical probability distribution statements about, you know, ranges of values, um, you know, statements that correspond to the verifiable statements that you were talking about. Um, and, and, and those statements seem to have a much more natural counterpart to the state vectors and more generally mixed states in the quantum case. Uh, so that we shouldn't be thinking about those objects as ontological in the quantum case. We should be thinking about them in similar terms to how we think about these sort of more um, you know, uh, instrumentalist notions in the classical case. And when we, you know, elevate our thinking to that level, we see more commonality between the theories. Um, so do I have that basically, basically right? Yeah, yeah. So the, the idea right. is always that we start what we can define uh, physically, and then we take uh, some sort of idealized notion, right? And, uh, and, uh, and you go down, but the, the point is that at uh, you know, if you imagine again, uh, even in terms of uh, uh, you know, I was saying op open sets are things that we can measure, right? Because they they have an interval of uncertainty, right? So if you imagine all uh, again all the open sets ordered by inclusion, then you get a lattice. The points are the singleton. Uh, well, the points are not even open sets. Let's, let's get the Borel algebra. But you have the the open sets are the thing that we measure. Then you're going to have these points, right? And we never measure the points, right? The, the points, uh, we don't even know they're there. Is, is really pi something that we can measure in infinite version? No. So we basically say, okay, the real value is sort of an idealization that we, we think is there if we assume that we can make our measurement more precise, more precise, more precise, right? But the, the real physical thing are the finite, uh, uh, the finite intervals. So those are the things that, that, that we measure. So these uh, things on top are sort of the real thing. Let's say the, the pi or, or E are in, in a sense that they are in realization and at a physical level, they are like less precise because these are not things that we actually go and, and work. So we basically have that approach uh, in, in, uh, in the whole project, right? In terms of experimental verification, you basically say, okay, the things that are important are the verifiable statements. And from the verifiable statements, you assume that they have some logical relationship and you get the points. The points are the idealization. They're not, you're not really so interested in the points because what you're really interested in are those. In fact, what can happen, and we don't know how to do th this mathematically, but we should have a theory in which you have uh, these uh, two theories with the lattice of statements, right? And the top level are the same, right? But the points are different, right? Because uh, uh, you know you change your idealization, you have some more precise way of describing, and so the uh, the, the, the sort of the limiting procedure of, of approximation they shouldn't be done because I made the points go somewhere else. You know, because I replaced the bottom layer, which I really didn't care about anyway, and I replaced it with a better bottom layer. But the top structure sort of works the same, and I think we, the same thing happened with. Uh, uh, the, the, the mixed states uh, ordering in classical and quantum mechanics. We believe uh, right, that the top layer of uh, classical and quantum mechanics of mixed states should look the same. And it's something that we need uh, to prove. It's one of the open problems that we have on the list. We want to be able to show that those things look the same so that when you go to high entropy, you can choose classical mechanics or quantum mechanics. You're not gonna make that mistake, hopefully, <laughs> if, if the thing works. But then when you go down and you, you refine, refine, the, the two structures start being different. And then you say, okay, classical mechanics doesn't work here anymore. I, I have to go to the other, right? So the, the point of phase space, again, the idea that the, the, your, class, your system that you're describing is really a classical system that have really just one point and so on, that's the assumption. And that's the thing that is going to fail. And so again, but if you stay up the chain, right? Up the chain, you have the things that are more connected to experimental verification because you have all the uncertainty and all the things that you have uh, that are hiding really the, the, the bottom structure, right? Because you have other stuff. And, but, but that's exactly it. So that I think you, you have the same characterization. We, we have both, basically, instead of having defining things from the bottom up, sort of defining the points and then constructing things from the points, we start top down. We, we define the things in the nebulous thing that we, can, we, we, we have, give relationship to that, and then construct the points. And then the idea is that uh, as we want to change the theory, what we're really changing uh, is uh, 
it's the bottom layer, not the top layer. The top layer we want to keep because the, at, at level of precision, the theory is bad. Got it, yeah. So I think that, you know, I mean, one can only ask so many things from a single talk and, and from <laughs> a single paper. In, in, in this talk, you're establishing this, this basic commonality at that much higher level um, and, and not asking questions about the underlying ontology. I think, you know, a, a lot of folks who are thinking in particular about looking for a good ontology for quantum mechanics, um, you know, I think there, there's a, a lot of debate about where to find that ontology, what it should look like. I think, you know, the traditional, you know, standpoint, the standpoint that, you know, for example, Everettians take is, is that we should identify maybe the pure states as being the ontic states of the system. What you seem to be saying is that they're much more akin to, uh, like, classical preparations and states of uncertainty. And I guess this then leaves open the question, so where does one find the ontology? And when I said that you can only ask so much for one talk, I'm not asking you to tell me where you think the ontology of quantum mechanics is. But I think it does sharpen um, the question about what we're doing and, and, and maybe redirects this question of ontology away from the pure states. But obviously that is up for dispute. I don't want to, to make a claim about that. All right, so let, let me uh, move on to our next question. Joanna, you're next, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would like to ask uh, what about symmetries in your framework, such as uh, translation invariance or uh, boost invariance? Uh, do they belong to the principles in your sense? Uh, okay, so in the logic itself, uh, there are no symmetries, right? We, we just have the definition of description of states. Now, uh, so it's a loaded question because a different system, a di different symmetries may uh, mean something very, very different uh, at a physical level. So for example, I could uh, uh, describe the uh, invariance of the entropy over time as a symmetry. And uh, that would correspond to the assumption of the deterministic irreversible evolution. And, uh, um, and so it has a place, but of course it's not a fundamental place because they say, well, you know, if I divide the system in a different way or I put some external interaction, the thing is uh, is not isolated anymore. You need to know the state of other things and so on. Uh, so it really, so how can I say, you really want, or we would really want to understand what each symmetry is describing physically and then elevate maybe that as either an assumption or a physical principle, which would be stronger than an assumption and so on. And so I can't give a general answer because it would have to be something that it's case by case. Uh, I see, I had in mind, uh, especially symmetries of dynamical equations. So for example, the symmetries of Galilean group are dynamical symmetries of Newtonian theory and so on. Okay, so let's see. So when, uh, so again, it has nothing to do with this talk. When we, when we start uh, rederiving uh, uh, Lagrangian mechanics, for example, we have uh, four things that we are essentially assuming. We're assuming that the system is infinitesimally reducible, that this uh, classical Lagrangian mechanics that uh, you have an independent degree of freedom, that you have deterministic and reversible evolution, and that we have, we have uh, something we call kinematic equivalence. That is, uh, the, um, whenever uh, you see a trajectory in, uh, in space-time, you can reconstruct the state. And whenever you have the state, you can... Uh, so you have a one-to-one -one map between the states, uh, uh, you know, dynamical states, and the trajectory in, uh, in, uh, in space-time. Now that, uh, those assumptions by themselves uh, make essentially the, the idea of a, of a metric tensor emerge, right? And then because you have the metric tensor, you have all the symmetries that uh, sort of relate to that, right? You're gonna have uh, your rotational invariance uh, and the, 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 the Hamiltonian that you get is the Hamiltonian actually for a, a classical particle under uh, vector potential forces. So you get all the symmetries that, that are there. So again, you should be able to relate those symmetries probably to the kinematic equivalent assumption and uh, the deterministic second reversibility assumption. But again, we haven't done that work uh, to, to sort of tease out exactly. That certainly would be interesting, but part of the reverse physics approach is essentially doing that. 
is uh, saying, okay, there is this thing uh, that I can say, and then this thing that I can say, and which one is stronger than the other, right? Which one implies the other, or maybe they're equivalent, they imply each other, right? And so this is type of, it's, it's in the spirit of, uh, of the sort of the broader scope is that we, we never actually did this particular thing. So. Thank you. Thanks. Our next hand is from Lev. Lev, please go ahead. Um, I raised my hand before, before you made your comment. And your comment is, was kind of my question, but in much more polite way that I will do. Uh, I'm really offended. For me, this is completely wrong. Uh, what's wrong? I don't know. <laughs> I, for me, the science should be done just the opposite way when you're doing this. Um, and not just you, just the big community. Uh, you, you had this example about uh, spin Y up and spin Y down. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of them should be true. Of course, it should not be true. Quantum mechanics tell us that it should not be true. And I understand that because our difficulties in this quantum logic race, uh, fortunately, it's not very popular today. Uh, I think we don't need to, to, uh, to choose our, uh, to change our logic to understand science. But the important point, the difference, is that if you talk about spin Y up, spin Y down, then uh, there might be situation that one, that both of them are not true because there is, and it's uh, by definition, of my definition, and is this, I would like that at least the community will change semantics. By my definition in classical uh, mechanics, definitely classical physics also, this cannot be not true. The whole idea, the difference, the definition of classical physics is that all variables have definite values. So it cannot be that even if variable can be only up or down, then one of them must be true. And uh, this is what classical physics is, definitely classical mechanics is. There is no uncertainty in quantum mechanics. There is no probability in quantum mechanics. There is no entropy in quantum mechanics. Entropy later, when you have many systems and you can use uh, low of large numbers and use mathematics and uh, get kind of useful thing. But classical physics is complete, is a completely deterministic story. I don't understand what kind of algebra you will put, what kind of, there is no algebra. There are F equal MA and there are some laws and there are definite uh, in all evolution. I also believe that quantum mechanics is like this. And so, so uh, as I nicely agree, quantum mechanics, classical mechanics are similar. Everything is pure states and they evolve according to uh, unitary evolution. And so everything else, the fact that I go to a laboratory and I cannot really prepare exact state and there is some uncertainty, and this is, a, I, as a physicist, want to find a theory. And the theory should be exact. It should not have any uncertainty. It should have not, nothing. It should tell me exactly what's going on. And definitely classical mechanics is like this. I believe it's a classic quantum mechanic with like this. Then there are all kinds of, if I go to experiment, I will put some mathematics and uncertainty of my, because I don't, this is not theory. The theory is a basic theory for pure state and definite states. And all this sigma, when I hear sigma algebra and whatever people call me quantum mechanics, I don't understand what they're talking about. Quantum mechanics is just, there is a, Quantum state and the, the rule of its evolution. There is one vector evolving, like in Newtonian mechanics. Where is algebra? Where is, where is all these things? Well, why do I need this? Okay, I'll tell you, you need it. There is a fundamental property in uh, mi is mixtures that is different uh, in classical mechanics and quantum mechanics. So there are no mixtures. No mix mixtures in cl classical mechanics, that means that I don't know. It's a practical thing. Mm -hmm. And in quantum mechanics, sometimes if you have composite system, then you look on this and you'll describe it by uh, density uh, uh, mm -hmm. matrix. And this is the only density matrix, only improper density matrix exists. Proper density matrix doesn't exist. There is no such thing. You say classical, there is no, the, the people probability theory, but there is no cl probability, classical, pro classical, prob classical probability physics. There is no randomness in there is no any proposal for 
classical randomness. So why you so classical mechanics and call it probability? I don't. It seems to me uh, you have to use some different name. Classical physics has no probability. I, 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 you can use whatever name you want. It doesn't matter to me. Um, to me, it, 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 the only thing that I care is this point that I was trying to make. That uh, if I give you a classical mixture, whatever you want to call it, uh, I, I don't care. There is only one way to decompose that mixture in terms of uh, your uh, perfectly defined states. Okay, so I give you a mixture. There is but how you can give me a mixture? But what do you mean by mixture? You mean that you know and I don't know? Well, what do you mean by mixture? I don't understand how you can give me a mixture. I don't. I, I, I give you a, a, a something that prepares a, a, a I don't know, a, a, that shoots a ball in a particular direction or a particular velocity. That thing is not always going to be precise, right? So you're going to characterize the, the probability of the ball. No, no, you, you don't do that. But maybe. In experiment, yes, but I will think that there is a one particular direction which I might not know. And when I'll make my physics, I will assume there is a particular direction. <laughs> That's what I'm and telling will you. Go with this particular direction. I will not describe it by mixture. I, 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 I can tell you why you should care. You, you asked me, why should I care about this? And I, I, I was trying to answer, but you have to let me finish the whole thing and then we discuss the whole thing. I keep interrupting me every three words. Okay. So if I have a classical preparation divide, it's not going to be perfect, right? And it's going to prepare some, uh, you know, position and velocity, whatever you want to call it, according to a probability distribution. That's what I mean by mixed state. And yes, you can think it as it's your uh, a lack of knowledge of, uh, of the system. That's fine. I, I, I don't particularly care. You can even have it as a statistical distribution where we have multiple particles in, in, in lots of different places. It doesn't really matter to me. The important thing that you, we have this distribution. Mathematically, in classical mechanics, uh, it is a property of these mixtures that they, you have only one way to decompose it uh, in, in, the, uh, you know, in the points, in, in your perfectly precise value. In quantum mechanics, uh, once you not have a pure state, you just have a, a generic operator, there is no single way to decompose it uh, into uh, pure states. The same mixture, can, can be achieved by mixing the, the, the pure states in different way. So this is why you have the problem in quantum mechanics. If you only think about the pure states, you are losing the fact that something interesting happens when you are creating these mixtures. And so that's why I'm saying that you, you if you only look at uh, quantum mechanics, only in terms of pure states and only the addition of pure states, and you miss uh, what's happened during the mixture, you miss the fact that the entropy works differently, and therefore uh, quantum statistical mechanics will have different problem, different properties to classical uh, statistical mechanics. You know that you know that every mix quantum mixture, I can purify by another system. So I take another system, purify it, and now I have a pure state, and, have, and uh, there is and nothing. And it's double to... the size of what you were looking at, and it's not. So, the... yeah, okay. So, but we're talking about concept. We're talking about theories. How to define theories? So now I have a simple theory for pure states. I don't need any kind of fancy topology, whatever, and uh, so it will, it will be the same like in classical physics when I have one particular. Uh, every time there is one particular point, now there is one particular state, maybe on a larger system. Okay, so how do you do uh, 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 solid state physics and, uh, you know, uh, statistical mechanics if you now have killed the entropy because you don't have an entropy anymore? You really need to be going to, to define the entropy on, on, uh, on, on the part of the system that you have purified. Otherwise, you can't do the theory. And then you have the same problem. It's not this. This is serious of foundation of, of physics. When I talk about foundations, I assume that I have super whatever. I know exact state. I have uh, somebody told me the wave function of the universe or every position yeah, yeah, yeah. of every particle. And I want to find which theory which governs their motion. When I go to my laboratory, and I also experimentalist and perform experiments, then I, I'm, I'm engineer. The question, the fundamental question, 
and it looks like you have a classical uh, uh, the mathematics will tell us what should be the physical theory physical theory should be for basic things not for something which i don't know uh, because my uh, then, then yes we completely system. disagree and we completely disagree. I don't believe that uh, at a fundamental level, we should be only be talking about uh, pure states. The, uh, the, the, the mixture are as important and in fact are more important because those are the things that we create in a lab and then we study. We never prepare pure states. Pure states are like real number. They're idealization that we have in our head and they're not things that we can construct. May I step in here for just one second? Because I think one of the issues here is I think that you mean different things by physical theories, right? Yeah. Gabrielle yeah. is is using instrumentalist language that states yeah. are about what we do and how we prepare things in the lab, what we can know, what we can, what we can measure. And, and when you look at classical physics and quantum physics in the language of instrumentalist theories, in terms of preparations, in terms of interventions, in terms of experiments, then there, there's this you know, commonality. And, and Lev is looking at scientific theories as statements about what really exists. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in some ways, Lev is taking the point of view that Einstein took, which is that a good scientific theory, we should expect more of it than just an instrumentalist description. A good scientific theory should be telling us what's actually going on. And in classical physics, yes, we can, we can approach classical physics in instrumentalist language, we can. But classical physics also lets us talk about what's really there and say, no, the system is really there. These probability distributions are just human approximations. They're not really part of the physics. The classical physics gives us this ability to say, no, the system really has some state in which it, in which it is and all use of probabilities is just, is just human convention. It's not really part of the underlying structure of reality. And, and if you want to take the same view of quantum theory, what you have to do is regard the pure the pure quantum states as being the ontic states. And then all this other stuff about mixed states and whatever, it's the same kind of thing. It's just sort of human, human sort of layering on. I think there is a dispute in the quantum foundations community about whether the pure states are in fact the ontology of quantum mechanics, but at least that's a view that one can take. But I think this is where the dispute is. I think that, that, yeah. that, that you're using different language yeah. and you mean different things by scientific theories. And Lev is pointing out, we should expect more of a, of a scientific theory if we give up on, on, on trying to understand them in ontological terms and only view them in instrumentalist terms. We're not doing science as fully as we should be. Do, do, I, do I kind of have that at somewhat right, Lev? Yeah, I completely agree. Okay, yeah. Well, the, the, there is a, a problem though, right? What happens if uh, the, uh, you know, all of your reality, all of the reality that it's the you is not accessible through, uh, through experimentation? If if I have uh, some theory and I assume it's like this, and then I perform experiment and they do not contradict my theory, the fact even that I don't see uh, galaxies which are far away from me, or I cannot see parallel worlds, doesn't uh, tell me that uh, my theory is incorrect. So you're okay if uh, I... Uh, imagine there is uh, something called uh, the cosmic charge that we are never going to be, be able to prepare, measure, or observe, and that's a valid theory to you. You have four cosmic charges, by the way. I mean, we're never going to be able to measure the cosmic universal wave function, right? We, we, yeah. we, we, there, you can propose that there is a universal wave function in some very high dimensional or infimensional Hilbert space evolving unitarily. We're never going to be able to know it. It's experimentally un underdetermined. But does the theory work if you put it in there? And do you have a nice ontological picture? And is there anything else available that could serve that role and still be consistent with quantum mechanics? Exactly. I'll give you an example from uh, uh, control theory. Right. In control theory, you define a system and then you have to find two properties of the system based on the inputs and outputs, the uh, observability and the controllability. Right. So if you don't have observability and controllability, you can do very limited things uh, with, uh, with the system itself. Right? And uh, I think there is uh, something similar right, that we have uh, to, to think about when, when we set up our experimental uh, apparatus and our, our, our idea. Right? There are some things that we can do, there are things that we cannot do. Right? So if we have a, a fundamental uh, uh, cutoff right, at the level of, uh, of a single particle that we can't uh, resolve uh, uh, what's going on inside a particle, for example, of course, we, we, uh, 
Okay, we can't say ontologically that there's nothing happening going on within an electron. Maybe the electron is a very complicated system that does very interesting things that are all universes with people living inside electrons. But if we have a cutoff that we can't uh, uh, observe what's going on inside an electron, right? Then uh, the, the question is, uh, should that be part of my physical theory or not? And my, my stance would be no. And I agree that you can have a different stance, right? That's fine. But as I say, that, that's where the disagreement is. I, I draw the line. So even in quantum mechanics, in terms of interpretation and so on, right? My personal interest is not to go below the level of what quantum mechanics predicts. I want to have a whole consistent picture based only on the things that quantum mechanics tells me so that I can understand that. And I'm even independent on type, on, uh, on interpretation and everything that you want to say. I mean, Gabriel, you, you, your, your point of view has a, a very distinguished history too. It was exactly how Heisenberg began his original paper in 1925, you know, when he formulated matrix mechanics. It's literally, he said, I, I want a theory phrased only in the language that you're describing. Right. Um, and thermodynamics started like that. Like when thermodynamics was started, people had different ideas. But, but let me ask you a question. Um, so, and, and we'll have to conclude this part of, we can maybe <laughs> return to this question later. This is a very interesting discussion, but let me ask you a question. And, and, and I hope, Lev, this, this, this is consistent with, with, with what you'd want to know. Um, Gabriel, I understand that uh, at, at some level, we have to be humble about what we can expect of our scientific theories, right? We right. want to phrase them in terms of things that we can actually verify and, and not be too hubristic, not, not demand too much. But given the immense success of classical physics and the reasoning that led to it, you know, and, and it was kind of an ambitious reasoning that we could really describe everything that's going on. Do you, do you worry that this shift in how we should think about scientific theories that I think to some degree you're proposing is, um, is not ambitious enough, is maybe um, uh, too modest, too, no, too, I, I, to give, I giving to too much away? Cut, right? I want to, so my interest is uh, where, uh, I want to know the assumptions that are underneath uh, the, the, the specification of the system such that I can do science, so that I know exactly where the cut is between, between the thing that we can describe and what is beyond. Right, so I just want, it's, it's, it's a matter of precision, it's not a matter of ambition. Whether that can be done or not, it's an open question, right, I have no idea. The, uh, the thing that we're able to do are like all these idea of mapping, you know, and uh, experimental education and so on in such a precise level. It's not something that we set out to do. We set out just to have some clarification and then this thing emerged. So uh, I, I think uh, we are, uh, in terms of ambition, we in physics have been overtly less ambition of the level of degree of precision that we can give in terms of the, mean, the, the meaningfulness of the mathematics and how to structure our, our uh, argument in mathematical language. So that, that, that's what I think it can be improved a lot. And then with that, we might be able to distinguish the, the fine line between what are the things that we need to have in terms of making science so that then drive the rest. But somebody has to try this approach, right? Otherwise, we're never going to know. Let a thousand flowers blossom. All right, exactly. we'll have to move on to the next question. But thanks, Lev. It was a really good discussion. Carla, you're next. Thank you. Go ahead. Well, thank you very much, Gabriel, for this uh, talk. And this ontological discussion is really good. It's, it's <laughs> really, really good. Um, I'm Carla. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Institute of Physics of the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. and um, I am working with the history of physics as well, especially, particularly with um, my current uh, research is about the analog gravity, analog, analog models to gravity. And I know there is this um, philosophical debate whether analogies are um, useful to assess physical theories or not. And it seems that with your vision on this, uh, on the um, on theory in general, you agree that analogies can be really useful, in particular if you have a special top um, logic, you can compare both bottom theories um, in a very straightforward way. 
So, uh, so what do you actually mean by analogies? I guess that's my question. So analogies, if you describe um, in a system, mm -hmm. in for example, I, I use the, the, the black hole system. So you describe a black hole system in an analog experiment, for example, the sound, sound analogy in hypersonic fluids. And for example, you get phenomenon like the rocking radiation in this analog model. Okay. And there is this discussion if this, if we can detect this phenomenon, this hawking like phenomenon, we are detecting the hawking radiation. So you have this discussion of whether analogies are uh, really make mean um, mean the same. If you if you detect something in an analog, an analog model, you can infer that it exists in the other model. And apparently, as I understood it, if you have a top logic that governs everything, if you follow the same logic, you are saying that they are uh, Right, okay, related. so you could frame it like this, right? You have two systems and you have uh, some particular assumptions on those two separate systems that lead to a similar logical structure and then uh, yes but the, 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 you still have the problem of whether the two systems really satisfy those assumptions right because the the testing uh, so if you go it like this you set the assumption you derive the mathematical theory and then you, you do the experimental verification what you're really checking is whether the system satisfies those assumptions and if the system satisfies those assumptions uh, you say ah i did it so what you proved on one side is that uh, if the system does satisfy this assumption and uh, I, I verify this, so then I say, yes, my assumption is verified. So the thing that would transfer is that if the other system satisfied this similar assumption, then it would have to do that. But you still have to verify that the other system actually satisfied those assumptions. But maybe you have another way to do it, right? Maybe there are two uh, separate ways. So, this is a, it's again, if, we, if we're able to elevate more uh, the, the, the discussion of the physics, more than the math on this like different way of rephrasing different assumptions, then, then you could say, okay, this assumption is equivalent to this. Whenever I have this effect, I must have this assumption. And whenever I have this assumption, I must have this effect. But there is also another effect that whenever I have this effect, I must have this assumption. Whenever I have this assumption, this effect. Then therefore, whenever I have this effect, I must have this effect. And then you can transfer on the other system. You measure this effect, then the other effect must be. So something like this, yes. But you have to be really, really careful that everything works out. But, but in principle, yes. This is a really good question. So uh, would you say, Gabrielle, that the, uh, the, uh, the, the point here is if you have like, an analog model of a black hole, right? Like a hydrodynamic, you know, counterpart to a black hole. Then, although there are some observations that have a similar structure, Carla pointed out that maybe you can detect, you know, an analog of Hawking radiation in this fluid model of a black hole. Does this tell us that we're actually, you know, discovering whether actual black holes empirically exhibit Hawking radiation? But the question is, um, the analog model is not going to be the same as a black hole in all respects. I mean, it clearly <laughs> isn't. I mean, it's made of fluid, and a black hole yeah. does not appear to be made of fluid. It, it, right. It's not gravitating. Black holes gravitating. There, there have to be some experimental verifiable statements about the analog system that are not the same as for an right. actual black hole. And as long as those exist, then they simply don't have the same set of verifiable statements. And and right. and, and and so ultimately. It, 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 your, your approach is non-committal as to whether or not you, you know this answers the question yeah that the structure that exhibits to those two properties uh, is the coupled from the structure that exhibits right. the other properties. right but the point is your, your your approach doesn't help doesn't make it obvious that that it doesn't provide an obviously better way to decide whether analog systems are really adequate for understanding. Now you you systems. would have to go in the specific of yeah. that specific uh, right. analogy and and do the all the work. That's why I'm right. saying that's a good question. Yeah, thanks, Carly. Do you have another question? You were going to save something else. No, no, uh, I'll just lower my hand. Thank you very much for the answer. Thank you, um, Logan. You said you had a bunch more questions. Do you do you want to go ahead? Um. 
you know, I think the discussion about Gabriel framing your states as being something prepared by a preparation device that can produce a whole bunch of so you know identically prepared systems and what you know how do I make a sense of a statement that says the mass of the Earth is between blah 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 and blah blah blah? Like how do I make sense of it? That is a that is a scientific statement that I can presumably go out and verify. I don't have you know an ensemble of Earths. <laughs> well, um, you have the ensemble. No, there is no planet the, B. You, um, you have the ensemble of uh, the uh, the Earth is at the different times that you're making the the, the measurement. Every, you're going to measure the, the thing and not one time. Like we keep measuring the mass of the earth and hopefully they all agree with each other, right? And in fact, they're not completely going to agree with each other because, uh, you know, the, again, the earth is an open system. So. Okay, let me, let me, okay, then let me ask a different question. Mm -hmm. um, how about a statement that the mass and spin of the black hole uh, product of the merger of two black holes that we measured with this particular gravitational wave was blah, blah, blah. That gravitational wave passes us once, we never see it again. Correct. What's the ensemble? So th this is, uh, okay. So if you remember the, the thing where I had this layer, experimental verifiability, uh, information granularity states, right? So the single observation is at the level of the, the single uh, 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 verifiable statement, true or false. But a single uh, verifiable statement, true or false, uh, right? It doesn't really, you don't create a, a, a physical theory of that. That's just a, a statement that you saw one time and so on. Right? So the question, the real fundamental question that we have, how do we take those statements, group them in a particular way such that we create systems? So for example, uh, I have a ball, right? I can measure the position, the velocity, I don't know, the pressure and the volume. I know that uh, the position and uh, the velocity go together. And the pressure of the volume also go together in, in separate way. I group them like that. I don't group, uh, I don't know, position and volume, right? And so the, the question is that, that there, is, uh, there is something uh, that tells us, uh, and it's probably the ability to, in, to, to make these degrees of freedom independent, uh, that some quantities uh, and some things uh, go together. So for example, I, I can talk about this uh, mouse as an independent system, because whenever I move this mouth, uh, mouse, uh, your mouse over there is staying still, for example, right? If every time that I shook this mouth, your mouse over there would move, uh, right? Exactly, right? We wouldn't probably be talking about just the mouse, uh, this mouse or my mouse or your mouse. We are talking about uh, this two mouse system that does that. So that, that, that what we're trying to, to understand, uh, and we, we're not there yet, uh, <laughs> that's clear, is, is this notion, how do we go from a bunch of disconnected observation of the type that, that you are saying uh, to the notion of, oh, now I have a system, these are the properties of the system, and now I have this other system that it's different from this, or uh, this system has these three independent degree of freedom, right? How, how do we do that? Yeah, I mean, I think you and Lev have taken, you know, pretty extreme positions on this, and I think I'm somewhere in the middle. I think, you know, just to take a to take another example, right? Sort of mm -hmm. the notion of quantum state tomography, which is a useful notion and something mm -hmm. that people do experimentally, that really captures only a very limited slice of actual experimental practice. And and so I I, you know, I think I mean, I like the mathematical structure that you've built, but I but I worry that the connection with sort of, you know, real real practice in the in the laboratory to me seems tenuous um and, and then we just need, need to make i mean better. i think i think that i think this question of like a, a statement like the the mass of the merged black hole that emerged that from this particular binary merger is you know in this range like and you know that's based on a lot of modeling and comp you know like there's a lot of stuff that goes into we think the mass of the merged black hole is in this range like that's a scientific statement that we're making about a one-shot event Mm -hmm. And I and I need to understand a little bit better how to think about how to think about that in your in your model. And, so and there's uncertainty there, but there that uncertainty is not the result of an ensemble. Correct. Yeah. Um, so that's uh, so as I, said, I was saying when we were making a discussion, I was distinguishing the the algebra of the distinguished uh, you know, of of uh, the, the verifiable statement where you have the uncertainty or that relates to the open set. 
that's the type of thing that you're discussing right now. And then there is the other thing about the, the entropy of mixture, which is uh, the, 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 the thing that the, the Jacobs was, were describing before, right? Those are two distinct things. Uh, and uh, the, the, this one, the one of the open set is more fundamental than the other, even just because mathematically you need the, to define these before you define the other, right? You need to define the topology before you, you can actually define. But, but, but what I'm saying is that that there's no one uh, thing, right? There are multiple things that are constructed uh, on top of each other, but the fundamental thing is the single observation uh, that is finite precision. I think in the context of this, I'm gonna go reread your other papers. <laughs> well, we can have another discussion. No. Uh, may I just remark that uh, all these ideas that measurement have to do with theories. Okay, of course, we, we, uh, we don't to build theories as a, to make a primary, con a primary con uh, concept measurement. I think this is a very unfortunate approach. But if I can interject to somebody working on Please this do, project with Gabriele. Uh, I, I, we don't. I don't think we think of measurement as having any central value. We think of science as being defined as empirical. That's what makes science science and not philosophy, faith, religion, other things that are that are very valid um, pursuits. And there are plenty of truths in, I personally believe there are plenty of truths out there that are not part of science. That doesn't make them any less important, but uh, it, it's really the, we, we take the definition of science as being empirical. That's what makes science science. And so that is not measurement and devices per se. It's the fact that science is empirical that led us to this, this structure, which is different from things like a lot of discussions and particularly particularly within quantum mechanics about measurement devices or, or the measurement problem. We, we don't have a measurement problem. We're just saying that if it's in the realm of science, it is somehow empirical. Yeah. Okay. It looks like you, you take concepts based on what you can measure. This is kind of a guiding principle. And I think the concept, I, uh, you look how the theory is, then you can ask, in, in which aspect you can uh, verify by um, or which are consistent. So not to put measurement in the center. In any, of course, in the end, we, we want to test if everything, everything is correct or not. But, I think but it's a little I, bigger I, than I, that. I, I, I would go in the same direction as you and, and even a little bit further. And, and to be clear, uh, I'm not taking any sides here. I think these are all really interesting. But, but to Lev's point, right? I mean, it's not merely that quantum mechanics in say an Everettian approach or in whatever you know ontological approach you want to take toward quantum theory. It's not merely that it's ambitious. It's not merely that it's going beyond sort of instrumental statements and, and saying what's really there. What you can do, for example, in the Everettian approach, if that's the approach you take, is account for how the measurement itself works, right? Like you have the resources, say in an Everettian approach, to, to actually devise a model of a measurement happening, see how it happens and see why in the Everettian approach, you get branches where people have different results. And that, it, so it's more than just ambitious in the sense that it's, it's claiming there's an ontology. It's also ambitious in the sense that we can model the entire process of the measurement and, and, I, I, and in principle, give an explanation for how it works and why there are outcomes to it, or at least why people see outcomes to it. And, and, Maybe there's a, a an argument that that dovetails with Lev is saying that that this other approach to, to thinking about scientific theories, um, you know, because it treats measurements and empirical results as as primitives of the description, you, you know, you're not able to to paint a picture of, of what it, you know, of what a measurement fundamentally consists of and why it has results or why at least we see that it has results. Lev, is that is that compatible with what you're saying? Yes. Yeah. I'm not saying I completely agree with it. I'm just describing what I think you're saying, Lev. Yeah, I, I think though that the program that um, Gabriela and Christina and others are working on is, is not actually taking measurement as fundamental. It's, it's actually starting with a more primitive notion of like what kinds of statements can we make logically? What, kind, what statements can we make about the world? 
right? And trying to actually make a connection between sort of a logical calculus of what statements we can make about the world with what does that mean about our theories about the world, right? If I can make only these kinds of statements, that might constrain the kinds of theories that I can construct. To me, that seems like, and that seems like a valuable, you know, point, but, but and, and maybe I'm misconstruing what you're trying to do, but my sense is that it's not, you're not specifically saying what things are measurable, but rather what kinds of statements can I make that could in potentially be in you know potentially be verifiable, and then from that you get things like notions of topology. Um, Gabriel, we have about thirty so. seconds left. I want to give you the last word. So uh, just to give you an example of how we construct the things, right? So uh, again, we start with the idea of verifiable statement. I can verify, for example, that uh, this mass uh, is lower than this mass because I have a reference map, I have a scale, and and I, and I see tilt, right? The idea is that we find the necessary and sufficient condition for when you have this mechanism of what would it need to say that the mass can be modeled with a real number. Right? So we construct uh, even the idea of a measurement scale just from the idea that, oh, I have references, they have properties with each other, and I can do this. And so when you run this, uh, you know, the, the framework allows us to find these necessary sufficient condition, and then you can say, are these sufficient uh, necessary sufficient condition actually result like in practice, are they verified or not? And then you say, well, at plant scale, they're not going to be verified, and then you're going to have problems by using real valued quantity to describe things in those regimes. Those are the type of things that they, they want to. So we construct the idea, everything from, like, as, as Christine was saying, it's not that we have measurement, we have these tests, and then from all these things, we construct everything else in a precise way. We're going to have to end there. I want to thank Gabriella again very much for your talk. Uh, I want to thank Christina and Gabriella for your, for your paper. I mean, it's, it's incredibly interesting. I want to thank everybody for being here. Uh, Rob and Lev and Logan and, and Carla for your wonderful questions. Um, we're going to have our next seminar as usual in two weeks. It's going to be two weeks from today, again on Tuesday, same time. Stay tuned for an announcement about it. Uh, the video of this talk and the question and answer will be available on through the website and YouTube channel soon. Um, so thanks again, everybody, and have a safe week. <laughs>